Hello and welcome to Connect and Collaborate. I'm Alex Hopkins, your on-air producer, and today we are talking about simplifying Colorado's sales tax. And I have in studio with me uh, Kelly Sloan of Sloan and Associates. He's also a frequent contributor to Colorado politics. That's right. Yes. Uh, so you're my politics guy. Got you in studio here. Pleasure to be here as always. Yes. And I also have Tony Galliardi. He is the state director for NFIB. And uh, Tracy Kraftharp, who is a state representative, House District 29. That includes Arvada and... Westminster. Westminster. That's what I thought. You know, I've been here for eight years. I should know my territory is a little better. <laughs> It changes every 10 years. It's mm. all right. Okay, good. Right. Good. Right. Well, welcome, you guys. I'm excited to get this conversation started on uh, simplifying Colorado state tax, but I'm going to let Kelly take it away here. We got some interesting as to why we're all related here, right? Right. So there, there are some uh, pretty exciting things happening in the world of sales tax uh, nationally and at the state level. Uh, you don't often use the words exciting and sales tax in the same <laughs> sentence, but uh, uh, but there are. And, uh I think there's three of them I think, think we'd like to uh, talk about today. First is, as you mentioned, the simplification of Colorado's sales tax system. It has a uh, well-earned reputation of being among the most chaotic uh, sales tax systems within the United States. Um, second thing we'd like to talk, talk about is the uh, recent, uh, or this year's Supreme Court decision, uh, Wayfair versus South Dakota, which has some pretty serious uh, sales tax impl implications. Uh, essentially what it did was equalize uh, between, or what's meant to do is equalize between brick and mortar stores and uh, internet, uh, internet businesses. Um, and third is sourcing. Uh, some new rules that are, uh, have come out actually already from the uh, Colorado Department of Revenue. Um, and with us here to discuss the implications of this are two of pro probably the uh, most authoritative individuals in the state on the matter of sales taxes. Uh, Representative Kraft Tharp, uh, as you mentioned, is newly reelected. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, representative from Arvada and Westminster. Also, uh, uh, freshly reappointed as chair of the House uh, Business Affairs Committee. Yes. Congratulations on that as well. Thank you. And she is also the uh, chair of the uh, Sales Use Tax Simplification Task Force at the legislature. Uh, representative Kraft Tharp is, um, as she has been for several years now, probably the uh, preeminent pro business Democrat in the state. Uh, category whose members have earned consideration for inclusion on the endangered species list. Absolutely. <laughs> Pleased to be there. <laughs> uh, Mr. Tony Galliardi, as you mentioned, is director of the Colorado State Chapter of National Federation of Independent Business, the nation's foremost organization of small business owners, uh, and certainly the dominant group representing such people at state level. Uh, Mr. Galliardi is also the chair of the uh, Coalition to Simplify Colorado's Sales and Use Tax. Uh, Mr. Galliardi is a fixture at the state capitol, as any of us that spend any time down there know, where he is doing constant battle, slaying dragons that are uh, arrayed against his members, both governmental or otherwise, mostly the former. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll begin with uh, Mr. Galliardi. Talk to us a little bit about the coalition uh, to simplify sales use task, tax in the state, uh, why it got started, what, what the problems were existing that led to the creation of the uh, of the coalition. Um, thanks, Kelly, and I appreciate the opportunity to be uh, with you all again. The coalition began right around four years ago, <clears throat> and the reason for the founding of our coalition was the complexity of Colorado's sales and use tax collection and remittance process. Uh, we you uh, hit on it a little bit in the introduction. Colorado is in the top four uh, states in the United States for the most complicated sales and use tax collection and remittance um, program. Right. Something had to be done with over 700 or 736, depending on who you talk to, different taxing districts. Um, uh, home rules, cities and counties, statutory towns, uh, and, and that. The process that businesses, small businesses such as my members, and um, large, large business, uh, the largest of the, the large, uh, the process that they have to go through every month to fi collect and file the sales tax returns as required by the state is just out of hand. 
And as conversation begin, began some years ago to build around this issue, it was, deter, it was decided that something needed to be done and something needed to be done now. And that's what um, uh, groups such as the Colorado Automobile Dealers Association, uh, NFIB, um, um, small and large businesses, American Furniture Warehouse, um, uh, Alpha Graphics, uh, some of the Alpha Graphics stores, food distributors, all it was amazing right. the way it just started mushrooming, said, yes, we want to be a part of this. We need to do something. So that was the genesis of the of the coalition. Well, then naturally the planning, uh, when everybody sat down around the table, it was, what do we do now? Okay, here's all of us. Here's the problem. How do we approach it? And we started planning. We started laying out an actual plan how to address each and every issue. Uh, we want to see ultimately a single point of collection. Uh, we want to see a single point of remittance. We want to see... Um, tools available to small and large businesses that make collecting and, and submitting the tax and with the certainty it's going to the right local government because that's another issue. A lot of times you may submit based on a zip code only to find out, guess what? There's four or five different taxing districts in that zip code right. and you just submitted to the wrong one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now you're facing the ramification of penalties and interest on a, on a late sales tax submission. Uh, part, uh, additional part of that plan was we need legislative help. We cannot do this on our own. We need the legislature. So naturally, a logical choice was, as you said, uh, to approach the most pro-business uh, uh, people in the legislature and the cream that rises to the top was Representative Kraft Tharp. Could you say that again so we could take that? <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure we got that loud and clear. <laughs> well, uh, uh, well, I, well, I think that's a good segue into uh, bring up the task force. And, um, and sure, because that's what led to the simplification. It was uh, a bill that was put forward by the coalition to establish a sales and use task simplification task force. Uh, and I will, and from that point, the rest is history. And uh, Representative Kraft Tharp uh, was named chairman mm -hmm. of it and uh, renamed chairman of it. So, um, so I'll let her tell you about the task force. Yeah, tell us, tell us a little bit about you know who, uh, the, what was the, well, we heard a little bit about the origins of it, but you know, tell us a little bit about the task force, uh, what you guys have done to date, and you know what you're looking to do. What some of your some of your goals are for the task force? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the legislature has tried to work on this issue for ever and ever, Tony. Ever. Ever. <laughs> yes. In 2014, there was a resolution that I was part of. Kathleen Conti. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure who else were on this resolution saying if we want to do anything around simplifying the sales tax, we all have to be talking about the same thing. This glass of water that you're picking up needs yes. to be the same as this glass of water I have over here. We need right. to define it the same all over the state. Um, and that seems kind of common sense. You both are shaking your head going, well, yeah, of course. No, no, no. That's mm. huge, <laughs> gigantic. So the state legislature said that uh, the a municipal league needed to uh, would take the lead around pulling together local municipalities to work on common definitions. And so that was in 2014, and the deadline for that was August 2016. Well, there's 73 home rule cities, and I think we're uh, about half of them, maybe a little more than half now, have, um, have passed ordinances to adopt common definitions. So that really is the core. We're working on that. Uh, but that is huge for cities to be able to give up their power, their control by uh, agreement on definitions. So we have to get that done in order to be able to do any kind of simplification. The task force, were, that legislation was passed in 2017. 2017. Yeah. We've met for two years. Yes, yes, 2017. <laughs> right, yeah. Really as a way of looking at if we're going to get something done, let's get together, let's, let's look at where we are at and where we need to go, and let's do that in a very comprehensive manner. So we pulled together a task force of the local municipalities because that's very important that they're at the table, uh, being able to talk about their experiences, what they can and cannot do, 
large businesses, small businesses, and then, of course, legislators. So two Republicans, two Democrats, two from the Senate, two from the House. The agreement was we would meet for three years, a minimum of eight meetings. We have now met um, for two of those years. We passed legislation last year um, out of the committee, and then we passed that in the legislature to do a request for information. What is available in this state? So if we're looking at some of the things that Tony was talking about, a single portal, an address locator, an electronic system to figure out if you put in your zip code, what taxing districts are you in? A taxing matrix, what are all the taxing districts that, um, that are there? Are, um, th um, that are there? Um, and then um, sales tax. So right. remember, right. every place that, that charges sales tax, you have to buy a sales tax license. And you have to renew that sales tax license, so we can't forget that. So if we had a single portal to look at that, who can do that kind of technology? So um, our bill last year was a request for information to be able to gather people, um, the technological ex experts to see what is available out there um, in the state and in the country. So we did that, that passed. We met with, um, we got responses from four different companies that were able to talk about some of the work that they do. So this summer we met, we talked about Wayfair, <clears throat> spent a lot of time, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Right. Um, we talked about use tax. And then the committee decided we have a bill that's coming this next uh, legislative session to do a request for solicitation in which we actually will move towards a single portal to be able to help businesses in Colorado. That'll help simplify that system. It's huge. That's huge. It's huge. Yeah. That's, you guys have come a long way. A long way. Yeah. Long way. So I just want to say that there's somebody in my district, um, Katie Winner, and she does podcasts, actually. And the first time I was on her podcast, she said, Tracy doesn't do the sexy bills, but she gets things done. <laughs> so, and now all of a sudden, sales tax is one of these it, big, hot topics. It is. It is yes. by far the hottest topic we have going right now. It is. Now, there, there's a, a national effort to simplify uh, mm -hmm. sales use tax as well um, uh, among the states. And as I understand it, Colorado is one of the few states that hasn't signed on to that effort. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit? That is correct. Um, so Colorado is not a member of the national sales and use tax. Imp um, so the SUTA. Uh, the s a single? Single sub. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> now I'm drawing a blank. It says uh, sales and use tax simplification. Uh, sure. Uh, yes. Single. They were just here in Denver talking about it. Uh, they've come to many of our task yes. force meetings to talk with us, and actually, um, so they uh, meet. Streamline. Streamlining, the streamlining streamline effort. Sim yes, streamline yes, yes. sales and use tax, yeah. Yes, and so actually I attend those meetings along with um, one of our legislative staff. So mm -hmm. even though we're not a member, um, we are part of the conversation. And we, it would be very difficult for us to be a member uh, for a variety of our reasons. Um, our infrastructure really makes it difficult for us to fully comply with all the streamlining efforts. Mm -hmm. Um, as Tony had mentioned earlier, um, our home rule cities, home rule cities are like states within themselves. They make their own rules, their own laws. No one can tell them what to do or how to do it. Um, and so we need to respect that. We have 73 of those home rule cities throughout Colorado. That's the core of the Colorado way of life. Tabor. Um, Tabor, which, mm -hmm. you know, uh, looks at the highs, the lows, the floor, the ceiling, and, um, and where we can go with that. Um, it's the Colorado way of life. Those things, however, do restrict us from fully participating in the whole streamlining effort. So, I, no, sorry, I just had just a clarifying question here. You mentioned infrastructure keeps us, uh, hold us back. As far as districting, what do you mean by infrastructure in that sense? I mean like that we have home rule cities, statutory cities, and then the state. Okay. Right, mm -hmm. and then we have Tabor, which kind of... Y wraps yes. around everything that we do. Okay, thank right. you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now, so adding to uh, to this already complicated mess that is uh, Colorado's sales and use tax uh, system are some new sourcing rules uh, come down from Department of Revenue. Uh, I don't know who, who wants to take take that one on, but uh, uh, essentially the... Uh, <laughs> well, I guess it was we'll, Tony's we'll, idea we'll Tony, to do uh, the sourcing, <laughs> wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Mr. Gallagher, can you talk, talk to us a little bit about what, what the change is and you know, how, how that changes, what the uh, remittance process was before was, it came into, uh, into effect at the beginning of this month, correct? 
officially? Three days ago. Three days three ago. Three days ago. So what the process was for a small business owner three days ago and what it is now and how that impacts uh, small businesses in the state? The um, <clears throat> sourcing rule uh, was done... Department of Revenue put out a notice of an emergency rule, and and um, that was the sourcing rule. Now, how it affects Colorado businesses is is this: if I am a music store on the main street of Longmont, and Kelly, you come in and buy a trumpet for me, uh, you're going to pay state sales tax, Longmont's tax, any other special district tax, local fire district tax, right. and so forth. That process is not going to change. Process is not going to change. What changes is that same music store gets a phone call, somebody looks for a trumpet, the same trumpet, they live in another part of the state Formally, prior to the emergency rule, the merchant w would ship it. Right. The customer was expected, basically required, to claim it once they got the property and f uh, pay the use tax. The sales tax then became a use tax. Right. Now, since the rule December 1st that music store is required to collect all taxes at the point of delivery so it's down in southern Colorado now that music store has to have some way or some database that they can go to and look up all the taxes that are due based on that address Right, all, all, all the local county, uh, the local county, districts, special yeah. districts, mm -hmm. uh, you name it, anything in common. Um, unfortunately, it's almost an, an impossibility for a business to do today, yeah. because most databases in use are based on zip code. Right. If you ship down into Mineral County, Mineral County has one zip code but seven different taxing districts. Right. Again, you need to know which one. I've had some of my members, and I represent a lot of members. I represent over 7,000 members in, in the state. Tell me that it's almost, ne it's, it's imperative that GPS coordinates be part of these databases. Otherwise, you have no idea yeah. where you are ending up. You cannot go by right. the by the zip code. So that's the change. So can I give my lawnmower yes. example? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So just to be clear, the Department of Revenue has been working on this for over a year. They've had a number of work groups and stakeholder groups throughout the year. Um, 33 other states, this is how they tax. So if Colorado, we were just talking about the simplification, Colorado has one of the most convoluted, complicated tax systems in the country. If we want that to change, then we need to become consistent. So that is part of this is we become consistent with other states. So my lawnmower example, tell me if I'm right, okay? Mm -hmm. I go buy a lawnmower at Lowe's in, in Westminster tonight. They'd be thrilled to death. <laughs> um, I buy it, and I put it in my car. I pay the sales tax, and I pay all the taxes right there in Westminster. And we all go home, and hopefully my husband mows the lawn, and everything's happily ever after. If I ask them to ship it to me, and just pretend I lived in Evergreen. If they ask, uh, so I want it shipped to me rather than put it in my car, then I pay the sales tax and all the taxes for Evergreen, not for Westminster. So the complication comes is, as Tony was saying, the low store needs to have a system where they ha know what all those taxes are for Evergreen. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. As I understand it, uh, how it was before if you shipped uh if, if you're a business that ships something, you only had to remit the sales tax for where you are and any that were common with where you're common, shipping it to. The so, commonality. Right. So, yeah. for for instance, if I shipped my trumpet across the county, uh, there would only be state sales tax or county sales tax. 
uh, whatever, if we happen to be in the same, say, school district, fire district, uh, if I shipped it to Grand Junction, likely only a state sales tax mm-hmm. would apply. What this is changing is now, as you mentioned, I, I would have to know if I'm shipping it to Grand Junction what their mean all what their taxes and those taxes. are the ones I'd have to remit. Yeah. So the Department of Revenue has a one pager, I just want to say. They have a one pager that lists all the sales tax rates and all of the different dis- uh, special district rates for all of um, the statutory cities and for the state. So uh, there are resources out there um, to be able to utilize. Not that it's not complicated, it is very complicated. Um, and what we are hoping is that this uh, one portal system that we had talked about earlier that has the tax matrix in it, that wouldn't this be a great tool for the state to be able to provide for businesses mm-hmm. that can do an address, you put your address in, um, it shows you exactly which district you're in, or you put the address in of where you're shipping to, um, can help with all the sales tax uh, licenses and the, the tax matrix. I have, uh, this probably seems like an oversimplified question. <laughs> I do, I have so many, actually. It, this is fascinating, isn't it? Is, it? It's truly fascinating. Uh, so, I, I obviously, taxes are collected by the state. So, because I live in Evergreen, well, they're collected. That seems like it's obvious, but taxes are not collected by the state. Oh, no. Taxes are collected <laughs> by the state. The state collects taxes for the state for the statutory cities and for 23 home rule cities the other home rule cities collect taxes for they themselves their own. and they actually prefer to be called self-collecting uh cities okay okay that being said are my taxes going to my city then because now we're at the delivery stage rather than where i'm buying from does that make sense is that mm-hmm. does that question make sense okay um, wouldn't it be more prudent to have that go to, a, particularly if you're ordering from a small store, not a Lowe's, a big chain, but a local store, From shouldn't it go back to the local businesses there rather than the city I live in? <laughs> One would say yes. Well, I think what, I think okay, what she, I think I, what, it's a, it's okay. a tough question, yeah. Well, I think what, what, what she's getting at is I, uh, there, there's some question that, you know, if you're if you're paying taxes, uh, and, and we'll get into a little bit more of this with the Wayfair decision and the physical presence rule, but uh, shouldn't there be, uh, shouldn't you have some representation of, shouldn't you get some services from wherever you're paying taxes to? So now if you're paying, if you're a business paying tax, you're located in Longmont, you're paying taxes to Mesa County, but you're not receiving any services from Mesa County, is that, is that fair? Is that, is that yes, kind of what you were getting yeah, at? Yes, <clears throat> thank you for... <laughs> Um, I how, know what I want to say. Yeah. How, did, uh, how do you respond to that, uh, Mr. Galliardi? Uh, I don't. <laughs> that's that's one of them that you could argue. Yeah, um, under the new sourcing rule, that's exactly what's going to happen. Right. Is I'm now okay. I'm losing everything, and it's going all. One minute. Two. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, and 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 I think we have to remember that you know, uh, consumers don't pay. Sales tax. They, they they pay the sales taxes on the on, on the tag, but right. it's the businesses, the small businesses that are. Uh, or, sorry, I got that the other way around. It's not the businesses that are paying sales tax. It's the consumer through right. the increased price. The businesses are so, collecting it right the businesses on, are behalf it on behalf of the of state it. and right. the taxing districts. So now you get into all kinds of questions of who is uh, who's paying the tax, who who's actually being uh, being represented. Is it the person in Mesa County that's buying it, or is it or is it the business? It's a, okay. it's a murky little issue. And mm-hmm. We're gonna take a quick break and and get through this complicated issue. I appreciate your patience with my questions here. Uh, I I say no, no tax at all, but alas, I'm how are we going to get roads and schools? <laughs> you want to drive on those roads. <laughs> exactly. Stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to Connect and Collaborate. Once again, I'm Alex Hopkins, your on-air producer, and I'm having a fascinating conversation here on Colorado Sales Tax. I knew it was a complicated system. I didn't know how complicated it was. No wonder we're trying to simplify it here, but to remind our audience, we have in studio Kelly Sloan uh, with Sloan and Associates, Tony Galliardi with NFIB, and Tracy Kraft, our uh, state representative for House District 29, Arvada, and Westminster. So let's get this conversation started. I'm ready. So uh, before we re- we get into the Wayfair decision uh, and we leave the state uh, sales use tax, uh, Representative Kraft, I'd, I'd like to ask, is there a 
when we talk about the simplification side, uh, is there a bit of a democratic imperative there? For example, you know, if people in one municipality or county want one tax rate, uh, people in another part of the state want a different tax rate, should they be allowed to do that? We see that, of course, at the federal level, uh, where, you know, in Oregon, the voters have decided they, they don't want a sales tax. Uh, Wyoming, they want a sales tax instead of an income tax. Uh, Virginia has a completely different system. Um, I find that argument a little more compelling at the federal level, where you're dealing with 50 independent states that aren't uh, political subdivisions of, of, the, of the national government. Uh, but does that really translate at, at the state level, where, you, where, you know, where, where local municipalities and counties really are political subdivisions of, of the state? Uh, what, uh, how, how do municipal, municipalities look at this? Why can't we just set one rate? For the entire state. Okay, so what, what I call this is, this is a good example of the Colorado way of life, in that uh, we have our frontiers, we have our rural, we have our urban areas, everybody gets to make the decision for their area, um, it's the independence, it's the independent streak here in Colorado. So the question that comes up all the time is, this is an easy fix, just do a one state rate, uh, pick a number and just do it. Um, so. It's not quite as easy as that. So if you are a local municipality, your sales and use tax, uh, tax is your lifeblood. That is how you are totally are be able to provide all the services for the people in your area, They're your roads, your, rent, your water, I mean, all the services that you provide. If we do a one tax rate, say we did 5%, if your rate currently is 6, that means a cut for you. Right. And where does the additional money come from? So that means you have to cut services without the availability to be able to get money someplace else to be able to find that. So if your rate is 5% and we do a tax rate of 4%, um, and so uh, am I doing that wrong? So if we, if we did a simple a state tax rate and you were to get more money, you right. run into a Tabor problem right. and that then mm -hmm. it's a change in tax policy. You have to go back to a vote of the people. So I think it's easy for us to say, you know, oh, let's just, you know, this should be easy. This is very complicated because we need to respect where the municipalities are. As Tony said earlier, it's difficult for our national stores that come in and are working here in Colorado. Um, it's difficult for our larger stores like American Furniture Warehouse, who, who spends a day and a half every month being able to work on their remittance. Our small businesses, I mean, it can be a nightmare, but it also has come, it's, it's a tension. It's a balance between our businesses and then our local municipalities. That's why we need to find a solution that creates that pathway to be able to make sure that everybody finds um, that, that simpler way. Right. So let's, uh, let's kind of shift focus to the national level now. And of course, we mentioned, uh, and we mentioned a couple times the Wayfair decision, Wayfair v. South Dakota, which was <clears throat> decided by the uh, United States Supreme Court last June. And essentially what that did, uh, as I understand it, was uh, South Dakota wanted to charge uh, or collect and rip, uh, sales tax from large in, uh, internet businesses that are you know selling within within the state. Uh, a 1992 decision, uh, Quill versus North Dakota. I'm not sure where it is about the Dakotas and, <laughs> uh, charging sales tax, but uh, uh, the Quill decision said that in order to collect sales tax, you had a business had to have a physical presence in the state. Uh, the Wayfair decision overturned that, correct? So it's saying that. Uh, so I guess it's just, just kind of walk, uh, Mr. Galliardi, maybe just kind of walk walk us through through the decision, uh, what it did, what that overturning that physical presence uh, requirement means. Okay, um, can I back up for just Please. a moment to what Representative Kraftarp uh, said about um, different tax rates for different localities? Right. That is a tenant. That was a tenant from the founding of our coalition to simplify Colorado sales tax is to make sure whatever revisions we made to the sales collection and remittance process remained revenue neutral for all of Colorado cities and counties and taxing districts. Right. Because we did not think it was our place to instruct one to ta charge this and another one to charge that. So I want to make sure that it is understood that was a founding tenant of the coalition to simplify Colorado sales tax. And one of the, the premises that we have maintained in the task force through the whole time is we will not move towards a state collected system. 
Right. And I have repeated that as the chair of the committee <clears throat> over and over again because the sta scariest thing that you can say to a local municipality is state's going to take state's care of it. State's going to do it for you. <laughs> we'll send it to you. Trust us. Um, so, yes, there's a basic mm -hmm. tenets, uh, promises that we've made that have been helpful to bring everyone to the table. Good uh, point. But that's different than a single point of collection, correct? Very different. Very different. Very, very different. But I wanted to make that make that point. What Wayfair did was, <clears throat> did one thing. It said, North uh, South Dakota has a right to require any online seller to pay states, collect and remit state sales tax, whether they have a physical presence in the state or not. That's, that's what Wafer, Wafer did. Uh, some will say it was a bad decision because it didn't go far enough. It didn't address the other questions. Others uh, are happy with this. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting. And just like with in my role as state director for NFIB, NFIB being a strictly membership-driven organization, I have members on both sides of the issue. So therefore, we are unable to take a position on Wayfair or the Marketplace Fairness Act right. as, as, Beca as, as such. Because on, on the one hand, uh, the decision is meant to level the playing field between you know, Molly Jones Bookstore on the corner exactly. and Amazon.com. Right. Am, am, mm. ab, 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 absolutely. So that's, that's really what Wayfair did. Whether you have a presence or not in Colorado, Colorado has the right to require you to collect and remit uh, the state sales tax. Department of Revenue took that a little further, though. It's they, only fair. You shop at I those like other it. stores, yeah, you pay I, it. I prefer yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, and and, 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 and that, 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 that's been an issue with, with, the, re, you know, with the brick and mortar retail stores mm -hmm. for quite right. some time, hasn't it? Sure. Now, of course, I, I guess the, uh, the opposing view to that I've heard, uh, kind of as we touched on before, is that if those stores, you know, Amazon doesn't have a physical presence, people, a store or something, now are they collecting tax without being... Uh, uh, receiving any services from that state, uh, that's that's kind of the tension you're, you're dealing with with between your members, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that kind of the okay? And and that's how we take positions. You know, we go to our membership and say, okay, here's the issue, background, the pros, the cons. Tell us mm -hmm. how you feel. And right. and and uh, as a membership driven organization, um, uh, right now we're we're split on that. We're we're split on that issue, but it doesn't prevent us from stepping in to discussions and to action concerning fairness in the collection and remittance process. Right. But maybe you could remind your members that, um, that there has comes. always <laughs> been an obligation to pay that sales tax. That obligation was an individual person. And I'm sure, do you shop on the internet? Uh, occasionally, yes. <clears throat> oh, more than that, you probably do. And did you every year submit to the Department of Revenue um, a list of everything you bought and how much sales tax that you owe? Oh, I'm going to plead the fifth. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's exactly why, uh, what the motivation is around this, because um, individual people all ha still had the obligation to pay that sales tax. So the sales tax piece is not new. That's it's right. just who had the obligation to remit it and submit it and who had the obligation to, to pay it. Which answers, does it answer the question of why Department of Revenue is implementing this rule now at the by far the worst time? Well, that's something that I was, I, I was going to touch on. A, why, why, is it an, why was it an emergency rule? And B, why are they doing it right before... Right before Christmas, Representative Kraft. Uh, the remote sales tax collection was not an emergency rule. The emergency rule was uh, the de minimis test that said that those businesses that do less than a hundred thousand or tw or two hundred transactions um, are not subject to this. So that's the de minimis rule. And that so, comes from the Wayfair case, correct? Um, well, no, no, no. Okay. That way, that did not have anything to do with Wafer. That was a um, de minimis established by South Dakota. 
Right. So in the court opinion, uh, the court the court said, oh, there's three things that we have to look at. One is the de minimis test. The other is uh, is uh, asking is a state uh, asking you to remit and collect? Is it too burdensome? And then, oh, golly gee, there's this uh, sales tax simplification. Um, isn't this a really good thing that if everyone would participate in that? Mm -hmm. But that was not part of the holding of the case. Now, the, the de, minimis, de minimis test uh, South Dakota said that uh, sales tax uh, was not to be collected from businesses that did less than, uh, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, 200 sales in a year or $10,000 worth of sales? $100,000. $100,000 $100, sales worth of rule. Now, so does that now apply across the board in, in, in the nation? No, no. 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 No, okay. that was not a holding of the case. That was, so, you know, in a court opinion, there's a, a decision or the holding, and then there's all mm -hmm. this other stuff that they say. Right. That's part of all the other stuff they said. Okay. Now, so how is that applying to Colorado then with the, with, with the emergency rule? So the Department of Revenue passed that as an emergency rule in September. They had a hearing last Friday um, on that, and um, we have not heard... That hearing was to make that real permanent, and we have not heard the decision. Right. Okay. Someone could come running in any moment. <laughs> the the emergency rule was supposed to take effect December 1st. Right. Right. The hearing was originally scheduled for October 30th. There was some <clears throat> particulars over at Department of Revenue. They could not have that hearing on the October 30th. It had to be postponed till November 30th. So we had that hearing Friday. Uh, however, the actual emergency rule took effect December 1st. Now, Department of Revenue, uh, in October, October 26th, in a, in a piece they put out, said for those businesses require, not able to re meet the requirements December 1st, we will extend to March of 2009, March 30th or 30th? It's not the 29th, but it was it the 29th wrong. of 2019? To enforce. To we will not enforce it. To, they will not enforce it, but we'll give them an opportunity to file by that time. So why, why not helpful. just... Yeah, it's helpful. Why not just delay That's the rule until, until that date? That's, well, you, you can do... Businesses have the option now. You mm -hmm. could do what you're currently doing right now, or you can follow the new sourcing mm -hmm. um, aspect. Um, you could do one or the other. You can't do neither. It's not okay to not pay your taxes. Right. 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 But I think they wanted to get the the new system in place. Okay. Well, fair enough. What I'll do you want to say that. about that? <laughs> <laughs> Are you asking me if I'm buying that? <laughs> Are you paying sales tax I, on that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll ask if you're buying that. Are you? Or... No. Okay. I, I, I'm not. I think this thing it was rushed through. Uh, we're asking for a total delay of the we want the process to stop now uh we are requesting that the department of revenue do an extensive outreach to businesses as i said i represent over seven thousand in this state um the first time this issue was mentioned to me mm -hmm. was over a year ago at the office of economic development that right. was the first time it was ever raised with me i never saw oh we're having these stakeholder groups I'd like to see who was part of the stakeholder groups. Um, but, you know, we had two other bills on the sourcing. On the sourcing, yes, we did. Right. One on data centers mm -hmm. and the other one, I, I'm not remembering, but I was the sponsor of both of them. Yes, you were. Yes. And so where we are right now is getting back to our request to Department of Revenue is to stop the process. Uh, allow for Department of Revenue to do a, a major outreach to businesses, especially, you know, rather than find violations, go in and let's try to do something to prevent those violations. Right. Make sure they get off on the right track. Make sure the tools are, are there. So we're asking for it to be delayed till March of 2019, and then let's come together and see what we can do. And well, my ask of the department, I met with the executive director last week, is to do major outreach. 
um, work through NFIB to reach all their 7,000 members, to work through our local chambers, our local economic development uh, councils, um, but they need to do in person, they need to do webinars, and they need to do written um, mm -hmm. outreach. And so um, my uh, statement to them was they may need to look at the March 29th deadline and may, they may need to make some changes <laughs> around that, but what's important is, um, number one, the businesses that are totally confused about what this is, how to do it, where to do it, when to do it, but I am more concerned with the businesses that know nothing about it. So I was sitting in a local coffee shop in Arvada last week, uh, meeting with the um, the president of our Arvada Chamber of Commerce. The owner of the coffee shop knew I was the state representative, but he didn't know I was involved in all this fun stuff. Came over to us both and said, oh my God, a customer just mm -hmm. told me that I'm going to have to start paying tax on these uh, uh, coffee beans that I ship, and I don't know where I'm supposed to get the information, how to do it. I don't know anything right. about What do you guys know about this? That's the guy I'm worried about that knows nothing, that has been working every day, working hard um, on his business, does not know about this. And so we need to increase the outreach. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and then finds out right before the busy Christmas season when they're already... Uh, I, I would guess fairly stressed out trying to you sure. know, trying to keep up keep right. up with the demand. Um, I'd like to come back to to that that de minimis issue one more time. So that was that threshold uh, established by South Dakota, correct? That that's what the Department of Revenue is going up is on South Dakota. Now, is that is that threshold appropriate for uh, a state the size of Colorado? South Dakota obviously has a much smaller population than does. Uh, Colorado or New Jersey or Texas, uh, uh, conceivably an internet business can hit that 200, uh, 200 sale threshold much quicker in South Dakota, you know, than they, uh, or sorry, much quicker in a place like Texas than they ever would in a place like South Dakota. Does that, There's does that... no geographic boundaries in the internet, Kelly. Well, no, but if, 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 so, if South, so say, uh, if, if South Dakota is charging, uh, a certain, certain percentage, I'm not sure what their percentage is, uh, and they're, uh, they're limiting that only to larger businesses, i.e. ones that are doing more than hundred thousand dollars worth of sales, uh, a business, uh, internet business is going to hit a hundred thousand dollars worth of sales, uh, much sooner in a larger state with more, with more people. Is that, that that's a that, that that's a concern I've I've heard in heard in places why that shouldn't necessarily apply universally. I'm under the impression that the diminis 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 say that three that, times exactly <laughs> that that law is only applicable to small real businesses brick and mortar stores right. No, no, no. That okay. is your internet site. So if you look mm -hmm. at uh, Molly's Knit Shop mm -hmm. that sells you know twenty thousand dollars worth of products, maybe five products over the internet a year. They will not have to re, um, remit and send us mm -hmm. the sales tax. Okay, now that's maybe that's my question: Is that hundred thousand dollars of sales total around the country, or is that only uh, hundred thousand dollars worth of sales within each state? No, no, no. That's your total sales. Ah, okay, okay, right. okay. So okay. I, Tracy, am um, shopping on the internet. I don't know if a store is in South Dakota or if it's in uh, Colorado or, or if it's in Texas. Right. Yeah, I have no idea. And I don't know what the sales tax rate is either until I go in there and it calculates it. Ah, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Gay, are there any, any mm -hmm. issues with the... Okay. Um, so with, with, the, with the new rule com coming into effect, uh, are there some legislative uh, fixes, uh, per se, that, that you may be looking at to, to help deal with this? So there's two things that we'll be doing this year. As we mentioned earlier, the task force has a bill that um, will be coming out. It's a start in the Senate. It'll be introduced uh, pretty quickly, beginning of the session, um, for a request for solicitation for a one-stop portal. Uh, there's a meeting with the Department of Revenue uh, later on this month to really hash out and clarify what the scope of work that will will that be and but right now we're looking at the address locator mm -hmm. um, the um, sales business licenses and then the tax matrix right. so that will come out pretty early um, I have a bill title filed uh, on the whole uh, remote sales tax the Wayfair issue 
um, that won't be coming out till probably mid-session. We want to really look at what's happening in the experience of the business community, the local municipalities, get the experience of the Department of Revenue, um, and to be able to put in a bill the things that we need. So, for example, um, we will codify um, the de minimis test. Um, I anticipate that we will codify that there's no retroactive uh, uh, sales tax collection. There is one state that um, apparently is looking at collecting the sales tax retroactively based upon that physical presence test because you have cookies on your computer. Ah. Uh. Isn't that yes. creative? So in Colorado, we won't be looking, uh, most likely we won't be looking at retroactive. Um, there's also the marketplace issue that we need to work with. So if you look at Amazon, if you look at Best Buy, if you look at Walmart, um, for example, they um, have the marketplace where they have smaller vendors who um, collects the tax? Does every one of those smaller vendors collect the tax for themselves, or does Amazon collect it for all of their small uh, vendors? Um, so what happens with that with the de minimis test? What happens with the complication around the sourcing rule? So we're going to need to sort that out. So there's a number of different issues, but between now and then, we have people like Tony, um, we have the Department of Revenue, we have people who, you know, keeping lists of what's the complications here, what do we need to d address through the legislature. Right. Uh, Ms. Galliardi, what are, what are some of the next steps that you and your organization are, are looking at, well, both the uh, NFIB and the uh, Simplification uh, Coalition? Uh, we are concentrating on our outreach to our membership, not uh, the coalition, NFIB membership. Um, <clears throat> We had, uh, I think, four uh, NFIB members at the hearing on Friday, uh, all testifying. Uh, various chambers had people there. Uh, local businesses who just happened to find out about it uh, were, were there. This issue has generated a lot of interest. We have information well, on our bad. website at NFIB.com. Um, the coalition has a website, Simplify Colorado Sales Tax. We need to get this issue out because, especially for small main street businesses, these people, you know, the business owner is the accountant, they're the HR manager, they're the janitor, they're the customer service representative. Um, they're, you know, handling all sorts of tasks. And, and this could turn out to be a, a, a nightmare for them if right. not approach properly and that's what we want to make sure are the tools there <laughs> are the tools valuable and useful and uh, are they accurate absolutely and so i have an ask of the business community and my ask is is that it's important that this is not something that i as a legislator um, am pursuing it's not something that the legislature as a whole is pursuing but it really is something that we want our local businesses and we want um, our internet businesses and we want our local municipalities to be able to work together in partnership on this it's important that our local municipalities know the experiences of our mm -hmm. business community so my ask is is that between now and june when the task force will start up again that our local businesses meet with their uh, city councilors with their city manager have coffee have a nice cup of coffee and talk about this is my experience in um, collecting and remitting my sales tax and to talk about the hours that it takes to talk about the number of staff that it takes to talk about um, the difficulties that they have so that the local municipalities can understand in the uh, last minute we have, uh, Representative, where can people find information on the task force and, and what you're doing? So the Colorado uh, General Assembly webpage, there is uh, a page on the, the Simplification Task Force. And if a business would be interested in joining the uh, Simplification ta uh, Coalition? Uh, coalition to Simplify Colorado Sales Tax. Outstanding. Um, Alex, thanks for having uh, having us on today. I, yeah. Um, I, I, I hey, hope, thank you. I hope some, yes. of your, uh, uh, some of your listeners have, have heard this. There's also... Uh, uh, illustrative column on this in uh, Colorado politics from last week. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the, uh, it, are you that Kelly Sloan? That, 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 would, that would be me. That's oh it. my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Did you just now rec realize that? <laughs> no, I knew that. <laughs> Thank you so much, you guys, for joining me. And I will have those websites available on our radio page. Be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube page while you're here. And uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.